I think we don't generally do this thing where the new chair comes and gives a talk and we thought it was going to be a good idea. And I have to say that a few weeks ago it crossed my mind that it was a terrible idea because if I mess up in the talk, I've messed up in like, what, five minutes into the job. Uh, so hopefully that won't happen. Uh, it is a great honour for me to be uh, the new chair of the AS UK. Uh, I, um, the AS is the reason why I have a PhD because uh, the AS Educational Foundation Award funded part of my PhD. PhD. And I've been working uh, in committees since I was a student in the York student section. Then I also worked as a chair of AS Cambridge. And I now also work um, doing uh, talks in the north of England. Uh, so very, very pleased uh, with a new position. But it's also an honour to be here telling you about my research on accessibility. And today I'm going to be talking about how sound design and digital audio technologies can help us bring films uh, through their soundtracks to people that cannot watch the visuals. And this project is um, a collaboration, uh, it's head to, headed in the University of York by myself, and I work with my wonderful colleagues, Dr. Gavin Kearney and uh, Christian Hofstadter, that base, is based in Anglia Ruskin University, and it's funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And the first thing I'm going to ask you to do today, and I'm going to warn you before we move forward so that you know, I, I like quite interactive talks. I know, you're going to have to speak. It's awful, isn't it? Uh, but I will be asking you questions. Uh, so be prepared to be engaged, I hope. But we're going to start listen to, listening to an extract of a film without any visuals. And I would like you to think about what it is that you're getting from the story. So what do you think the film is about? Uh, how many characters there are, what they're doing, what they're feeling, etc. This is just gonna play uh, through the loudspeaker, so no need for the headphones yet. So are you ready? Yeah. Yay! Yeah, that's better. Cool. ideas of what was happening there? Anything that comes to mind? Anything that you understood? They were given something, I don't know. Some, yeah, they were given something, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Hospital? Yeah, not very nice. Sorry? Not a very nice hospital. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's 
an internal struggle somebody is having, but there seems to be a mother figure or somewhere okay. on the outside. Okay. But it's the person on the outside is obviously really not central to the struggle. Okay. Oh, I like that, the internal struggle. I like that. <laughs> it's very poetic. Uh, anything else? Anything so at all? The characters were detached. I, I think that it seemed to be a bit dangerous. Something was going on there that wasn't quite right. Yeah, there wasn't the most pleasant of audio clips, wasn't it? A lot of spitting and stuff. Okay, anything else? If you watch the film, you're not allowed to say anything. <laughs> so, very little. I mean, we have the idea that there is someone, uh, there, is a, there is kind of a main character that is in distress. Uh, we might have potentially a hospital setting. Uh, we have another mother figure character. There is something internal going on, uh, maybe something mysterious, but that's all we have. So imagine if you've had to watch a film like that, and that's all the information you get. It's kind of frustrating, isn't it? And this is the reality that many visually impaired people have in the world if there is no access service to make those films accessible. Now, there is one access service available for visually impaired people. Do you know what it is? Yeah, very good. Audio description. And, and, and do you know what it is? Exactly, yes. It's a pre-recorded verbal commentary that describes what's in the visual channel of the film. If it's on, in cinemas, yeah, they would be definitely over headphones. And it also, it doesn't just describe the visual aspects. If there are any sound effects that have been deemed unclear um, by the person that did the audio description, they would also be accompanied by a description. So I'm going to show you the audio described version of only part of that clip. Sorry, it's a very, very dark film in many ways. So I, I apparently cannot make any happy films. I don't know what's wrong with me. Moving towards a bed in a large gloomy room in daytime, everything's slightly blurred. There, a young woman, Margaret, is sitting up facing a window of bright light. Her dark wavy hair hangs loosely down her back. Curtains frame the window, and a small lamp glows to the right of it. An older woman, June, stands beside the bed, watching her. The glare from the window dims, and the image focuses. June quickly pulls back Margaret's hair, then puts a metal bucket down in front of her, which Margaret picks up. Another woman walks in. June. Okay, we're going to stop that uh, there. So, any comments on what you heard? Uh, you feel free to destroy it. I didn't make it, so that's fine. <laughs> so, this is a very traditional form of audio description. So, this was done by an audio description company. Anything you like, you didn't like? Yes. Okay, what do you mean by no context? Well, you can't really, I mean, obviously this watching clip is difficult to interpret. So, uh, yeah. yeah. A bit disconnected. I mean, it's just kind of a flat description. It is an audio description. Yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't actually participate in the film in any way. So yeah. It's riding on top of it. Yeah, absolutely. It's just about script directions. Yeah. It's, huh? Anything else? I don't, okay, I mean, I don't have anything to compare it with, so I don't really know yeah. what it could be like. Okay, yeah. I, I accept everyone as criticism that it might be, it could be better. Yeah, anything else that you liked or you didn't like? Can I defend it? Because yes, you can. Because lead somebody to a conclusion which would spoil the plot. <laughs> so is that a defence or, or not? I'm defending the very flat description. Oh, I see, okay. You know, if you tell people too much, it's, it's going to spoil something nasty that's going to happen. Yeah, that's true, yeah. <laughs> in front of the window. <laughs> <laughs> so, interacts the tone, I, think. I was just going to say, it gave more description than the visual because <laughs> you wouldn't know their names. It's not like they were wearing name badges or anything. You know, the, I missed that. <laughs> but you know, at the same time, the audio sound design can create some sort of emotional aesthetic mm. that you're missing now. Yeah. Play duration. Good. Anything else? I kind of say it most of it. You're doing my job for me. Then I like it. Uh, 
I've never experienced an audio description. What comes through the headphones, is it just the description? No, it is the film as well, yeah. Yeah, so it would be something like that. So the soundtrack together with the film, yeah. Uh, no, <laughs> not, not in a cinema setting. Okay, so it is a system that has its advantages and disadvantages. I mean, you've mentioned most of the problems. So let's start with the good stuff. It is, at the minute, the only accessibility measure for visually impaired film and TV audiences, and also uh, museum galleries, exhibitions, etc., cetera, theatres. Uh, so if you're a visually impaired person, the only thing you have is audio description. So it is very important that it continues being produced. And nowadays, uh, broadcasters in the UK um, broadcast about only 20% of their programmes with AD. This is, of course, extremely problematic. 20% is not a lot. Might be that the show that you're really eager to watch is the one that isn't described at all. So very, very important that we continue pushing, uh, even with its disadvantages, for it to be produced more and more. Another advantage is that it allows people that have no sight loss or a diminished sight loss to be able to have an experience that is comparable to the one of a sighted person. And it's also been proven that audio description can help boost confidence and self-esteem. So say you are a teenager, uh, you watched, um, anybody been watching The Good Place on Netflix? You should be watching, it's very, very, very good. You've watched The Good Place or something else and you want to go to school the next day and talk to your sighted friends about it. You don't want to be worrying about whether you understood what happened or not. You want to have that confidence. And that's what audio descriptions provides to loads and loads of people around the world. But as you said, there are problems. One of the problems is that it is a system that is outside the creative process of making a film. So a film gets completed and then it goes to an audio description company that writes the audio description script and records it. So the filmmakers have no involvement in the creation of the audio description and the audio describers have no involvement in the film. So ultimately what we're getting is really an interpretation of the film done by that audio description um, that group of audio describers. And something that most people don't realise is that audio description users are not necessarily aware of this. Uh, and once uh, in a focus group, one lady, when she found out this out, she told me, well, I might as well just have a friend tell me in my ear what's happening, because why would the audio describers know more than anybody else? Another disadvantage is that uh, something that you've may have noticed, I think you kind of picked up on it, is that it's very much focused on information and having the exact amount of information or more information doesn't mean you're going to be more entertained. And what's more, when you say something, things become more obvious than when you see them. So I'm not particularly that bothered. I, didn't, I don't think I've ever focused with my sight on that small lamp that's on the right hand side. But by saying it, it becomes more important than maybe it is. So that's quite problematic. Another problem is that it masks all the information or a lot of the information that is in the original soundtrack. So if any of you are designers, surely you, lo you play sounds in a soundtrack because they have a meaning and they have an aim. And if suddenly we're adding uh, another verbal commentary that is masking those elements, then we're losing part of the information. And it's those problems that the Enhancing Audio Description project uh, is looking at solving. And the project is now in its final month, so we're finishing in May. So I'm going to talk you through some of the processes that we've been working on, on trying to try to tackle those uh, problems. And a very important thing to know is that we're not proposing in the project that we're going to get rid of audio description and do something different. We're proposing that there might be a need, that there is a need for personalization. So something that makes me quite angry actually, and uh, I once um, had the pleasure of filming um, Germaine Greer in a talk, and she, um, regardless of what you may think of her, she's a wonderful speaker, and she said in her talk that she always researched things that made her angry. And I thought, that's great, that's true, we should research things that make us angry. And what makes me really angry is that there is no diversity in the accessibility sector. Accessibility should be about acknowledging that people have different access needs, but actually there isn't any diversity 
in audio description. Audio description is assuming that everybody will be happy with that form of access. So your options are you switch it on or you switch it off. Those are your options. That's not diversity and that's not equality either. We're assuming that everybody that has a visual impairment is the same. And I think that if we've asked anybody in this room what their favorite program is, we would all have different answers. Why assume that everybody that has a certain type of disability is the same? So incredibly problematic. And incredibly problematic in an age where we have object-based broad broadcasting that allows us to modify the content at the end user stage. So if you've been following some research, for example, from BBC R&D, we know that we could, say, modify the length of a radio program to match the time that it takes you to commute. So why not use that technology to bring people that needed diversity? So maybe you can choose. Do you want a super detailed description with every color of every costume? Or do you actually want something that's quite minimal? Do you want something traditional? Or do you want something that's different? So this is what we are exploring. Fewer verbal descriptions. So we said that that overriding commentary is masking a lot of that information. And we can actually solve that by reducing the verbal descriptions and letting the sound effects speak for themselves. If any of you have worked in film, you know that uh, as a location recordist, you're going to record much, much more than is going to make it to the final version of the film. Why not actually use that for the advantage of those members of the audience that cannot see? We might have time later to see um, watch a short scene that in its original version is from the same film that we watched before, Pearl. In its original version, the ending um, was a be this beautiful montage, very dramatic of this girl running uh, along the beach uh, with this very nice um, underscoring. That's great, I love that scene, but if you cannot see the visuals, you have no idea what's going on. Why not bring back the footsteps of that person running along the beach? Why not bring her breathing, telling us that she's there? the ambience, the waves, seagulls, etc. So those are things that are very, very easy to do and they do not imply a further cost for the production. Spatial audio. This project worked a lot on, well, mo worked mostly on binaural audio. And our idea was that we could reduce the number of verbal descriptions if we told people information about the characters and the set through spatialization. So we could tell that a character was moving from left to right, from front to back, maybe that there was a grandfather clock on the right surround, or there was a fireplace in the center, etc. And this implies that we need to break the conventions of audio mixing. So as I'm sure many of you know, in conventional audio mixing for film, the dialogue is part of the center, any main foley also goes to the center. And the use of more extreme spatialization or more obvious spatialization gets reserved for special effects of a spaceship moving around or for music. Now, if we go to the history of sound for film or uh, synchronized sound for film and spatial audio, we realize that that is just a result of the limitations that existed at the time. So the fact that the surround speakers weren't full range and the front speakers were. So we cannot put voices in the surround because they wouldn't sound as good. There's also always been a fear of what's called an exit door effect. So the fact that someone's gonna hear something from the back and suddenly we're all going to turn to look at the exit. That's a bit ridiculous to be honest because something is only an exit door effect if you can prove that people actually are going to turn to look at it. If there's no evidence, then it's just an assumption. So what we've been doing is actually breaking all those conventions and panning the effects and the dialogue. And both our research with sighted and visually impaired audiences show that people don't mind panning of dialogue. They actually accept it quite naturally and they don't find it to be in mismatch with the visuals. So maybe we start need to start reconsidering what those conventions are and whether we need to continue following them. If you want a mainstream example of this, watch the film uh, by Pixar, Cars. Cars uses panning of dialogue all throughout. It does something a bit more subtle than what we did, so it uses spares. So if, say, one of the cars is on the left, it's going to use the left and the centre speaker. It's on the right, it's going to use the centre and the right. But it does work beautifully, it's very smooth, and it gives that very nice sense of movement. 
The last thing we've been testing has to do with a fancy term that's called iVoice, which is nothing more than a first-person description. It's like an internal monologue. So as you said, we have this in traditional audio description, this a bit slightly monotonous voice that tells us what happens. It has nothing to do with the story. That might have the advantages of not giving away certain things, but it's not integral. So what we have been experimenting with is in having one of the characters of the film tell us what's happening, how they're feeling. And in this way, turning it into part of the film, but also a poetic device. Now, I'm a believer on asking people what they want before you go and spend a lot of public funding on it. So before we started the project, we conducted a survey with 127 people and we asked them what they wanted. So what they liked about the current system, what they didn't like, uh, what they wish was different. And we also conducted uh, eight focus groups uh, around the country and we showed them the full uh, short film uh, Pearl, which is a third year production from students at the University of York. Without any accessibility measures, we played the film and we asked them, what do you think it is about? What did you understand? And we started brainstorming ideas on how we could make it accessible. And those ideas are the ones that we took to the design process, the redesign process. So we took the film, we deconstructed the soundtrack, we redid it, we used what was there and we recorded some extra stuff. In addition to that, to be able to make choices on reverberation and also panning, we did conduct listening tests uh, with all with visually impaired people. So we didn't use sighted people with blindfolds. That doesn't really work. Uh, we did engage actively with audio description users. Once the film had been redesigned, we conducted interviews. Uh, again with visually impaired people. So we divided uh, our participants into three groups. Uh, one of the groups watched the original film, another of the groups watched the traditional, uh, the, the original film with the added traditional audio description, and a third group watched the enhanced version. And we all asked them the same questions. And there we were looking to see if there were any advantages of in, uh, engagement, uh, whether the story was clearer, etc. And we're going to go back to that in a second. In addition to that, it does sound a lot, we did a lot of stuff. Um, we did focus groups at the end of it. So once we redesigned the film once more based on the interviews, we invited uh, mixed uh, groups of people. So the project, and what I haven't mentioned uh, yet, is that a lot of the project has to do with uh, social inclusion and sharing experience. So a lot of what um, our visually impaired volunteers tell us is that their family doesn't like audio description. Their friends don't want to go to their house and watch audio description for many of the reasons that you said you didn't like it. So having an experience that is accessible but also enjoyable by everyone regardless of their sight condition is an extremely powerful way of engaging with social inclusion. So, we also captured what sighted people felt about that shared experience. Now, before I continue talking about the project, I would like to share some examples with you so that you rest from hearing my voice. So we're going to see the, we're going to watch, there's going to be visuals, uh, the first sequence, uh, the one from the start of the talk, but with enhanced audio and I hope you get enhanced audio through those headphones, some audio through those headphones. I sit on my bed, my dingy room full of shadows. The only light is from my window. I face the light, waiting for it to start again. The nurse brings the silver bucket and gets me ready. Mother comes in. I don't know what happened, it's worse this time. She gets the oxygen mask. As something moves under my skin. Oh. 
there's only one way to get them out. <coughs> Mother takes the bucket away, leaving the nurse to clean me up. There now, see? It wasn't that bad. It's all over now. Mother extracts the pearls I have produced for her. And makes a note in her little book. Only two today. But it starts again. This time there is blood. is over. I look to the light again. <sighs> okay, so that is um, just to tell you a little bit about what was done with that section. So of course we have that first person narration, so we brought the actress back in. Uh, the script was written, in this case because it was a film that was already completed. We did bring a professional screenwriter that was familiar with the production and she wrote it for us. Uh, in the case study I'm going to talk about in a few minutes time, uh, ideally is um, the workflow would be that the script writer actually writes the first person narration. So they make a choice together with the director of what gets described and what doesn't. And uh, as you may have noticed, uh, we also added a lot of sound effects, for example, her grasping the sheets. Every time um, we worked with the idea of uh, sound marks, so something, uh, sounds that help the listener associated with specific events. So uh, the idea of the pearls is always accompanied by the same sound effect. And uh, because it accompanies the logo as well, the idea is that next time when the listeners hear that high frequency sound, they will make the association with the fact that there are pearls involved. And hopefully you were able, if you were wearing headphones, get the idea of spatialization um, as the, um, the dialogue and the sound effects um, move around the screen. Okay, we're going to watch scene that comes right after that. My house is isolated. The inside is unwelcoming as the outside. The rain gets in. In the hall, mother takes a moment to despair. The nurse joins her. You're wondering about these pans. It's the roof. This house has finally got the better of me. And there's no fixing this except hoping it won't storm anymore. You're going to quit, yes? I can't carry on, Cecily, pretending this is all right. She's a sweet girl, the sweetest. But she's dying, and I can't sit idly by and watch. In the bare kitchen, there are many bottles of drinking water. Although Mother pours away the rainwater. I'm not standing here pretending she's not ill. Human beings aren't made to do what she can do. I know it's serious when someone coughs up blood. But Margaret's going to fight this, and she's going to make us fight this. Okay, we're going to stop that on there. So again, that idea of a very minimal uh, first narration here, because we have uh, the dialogue being quite present, but hopefully you noticed 
uh, the voice is being panned and the sound effects as well. Now, what I wanted to show you is what we did to that ending uh, that I explained before was very much dominated by music and how we made it accessible so that uh, our visually impaired audiences actually found out what happened at the end of the film. So I'm going to first play you um, what was the, the original version so that you can tell the difference. <coughs> so this one isn't in binaural audio, so you won't need the headphones. Okay, we're going to, sorry, spoiler. I know you cannot wait to know what's happening. Oh. Okay, so this is the original version, so the one that was designed by the students a while back. like that scene I think it's beautiful but if you can't see the visuals there's no chance you will get what's going on and this is exactly what our volunteers told us when we showed the original film they said we have no idea what happened um, and actually a vast majority of people thought she had died uh, because of, of the dramatic music so I'm going to show you what it is that we did with that ending so we changed that was one of the sections that we changed the most actually I run away from the house whilst they force the door open. I make it to the beach. and the doctor are not far behind. I just want to get to the sea. Margaret! The waves. blood again and it's hard <gasps> to breathe. So that is how that scene was changed. So it was changed quite radically in the sense that we went back to uh, the Foley effects of the film. We actually had to record them because they didn't exist in the original one. Uh, so we went back uh, and redesign the soundtrack. And I'll show you now what happened, what was the results of this redesigns we did. So I told you earlier that we interviewed people and we asked them, uh, we showed them different versions and we checked what the responses were. And there you have them split between original AD and enhanced audio description. And the yellow and the orange one indicate that they were very confident or quite confident about the plot. So we can see that from the original version to the audio description version, there was a high increase in the confidence in the plot. And actually, there's no significant differences between the traditional form of accessibility and the one we created. Engagement as well, there was an increase of engagement when they felt they could follow the stories, which is actually quite an obvious thing um, for it to happen. Very interestingly, the accessibility features, so how accessible people perceived the film was, uh, our new version scored as high as the traditional form of description. And the same with how adequate that the number of descriptions is and the amount of description was. Now, this shows us that although there's things that we can improve, 
There is also the fact that our version, even though people are listening to it, having not been trained in years of experiencing it, is experiencing it, it's performing just as well as traditional methods. Now, I've been doing versions of this stocks for you for a couple of years, and I generally at this point, I get the following. It's money. No one's ever going to pay for this. Uh, you want actors to come and record lines. People hate doing that. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, why start by thinking like that? Anything that you want to change, if you're going to think about how difficult it's going to be, you're never going to change anything. Uh, the truth is that actors have to come and do ADR lines, so dubbing lines, that's in their contracts. They can come and do the lines for the first person narration when they come and do those. Also, I might, may, maybe it's just me being naive. I, I kind of try to believe in people. I try, sometimes it doesn't work out. Um, I think that many people are going to do it, are going to engage with accessibility in the production process because it's the right thing to do. Because thinking about who your audiences are is key to the reason why many people become artists, become filmmakers. The next question, and this is the, the more de most depressing care bear in the world, is that nobody cares about sound design. Filmmakers don't care. I actually, I'm a bit tired of hearing that because I think it's just become this cliche that people repeat. And I don't, I think it's just coming from a very old school way of thinking. Uh, I have the pleasure of uh, not just teaching in a specialized sound design course, but I teach a BSc in film and TV production. And part of my job is to actually teach undergraduates that want to be directors, cinematographers, might not care about sound at all. What, what it is like to do the sound for a film and show them that to make those great ideas, dreams of their wonderful Oscar winning film, they need to think about the soundtrack. So if we're training as audio engineers, that next generation, I think that we can train people that actually do care. And I had the pleasure uh, just to support this uh, kind of, uh, kind of undermined is the skeptical comments. I've had the pleasure of working in the last two years with a wonderful panel of industry members. So ITV and Dolby have been supporting the project and um, Sonora's post-production house that is led by uh, the wonderful Howard Bargroff has also been supporting the project. And that, this means a lot of individuals have, have big, been giving up their time for free just to give us advice. The same with Lisa Holtzworth, who is a professional script writer, and of course, charities and audio description company. So I believe that if we can engage the industry in change, we can definitely make a difference. And also, my students show me that we can make a difference. A few months ago, I put out a call for a group of students to uh, produce a film and their aim was to produce a film that from the onset followed our accessibility guidelines. So they had to sit down from the script writing process and think how that was going to be accessible to visually impaired people. And it was so inspiring, so amazing to see them kind of receive their emails and ask me, okay, you know, I was thinking about blocking. What do you think I should do to make this? Is there anything I can do as a director to make it better? And people suddenly kind of worrying about things like closed captioning, which is something our students might never have asked before. And that kind of gives us hope that we're training a new generation of people that will care about their audiences. And their film called Shelf Life, that's just the, the draft of the poster so far, um, is a seven minute science fiction film um, that it's, it's kind of completed and we're going to be sending it to festivals and hopefully it's not just to showcase their final product and the, the great work they did, but also show that we can do something really creative with accessibility. And the reality is that so far in the case studies we explored, when you compare the original non-accessible versions with the enhanced versions, people prefer the enhanced versions, even if they're sighted. Thinking about accessibility really pushes your boundaries as a sound designer. And for me, having to think about, okay, what happens if someone can't see that? You'll see people becoming really, really creative. And I guess that's something to what I wanted to finish off with, and uh, maybe it's echoing uh, Charlie's introduction today is that we need to start thinking about who our audiences are. Media mainly is telling us our audiences are white, male, middle-aged. I'm sad to say that maybe this room 
is proving them right. I hope that in the future it doesn't, but that's not who our audiences are. Our audiences are very diverse and that includes people of several gender, male, female, non-binary people with disabilities. And I hope as audio engineers and designers, filmmakers, teachers, you do take that to your students and to your work. You're going to be extremely rewarded with how creative it will make you uh, and also how good it feels to use audio technology, uh, not just to do something that's fun or cool, but also to help society take a step further. Thank you very much. Thank you. We do have some minutes for questions, I believe, if anybody has any. Oh, cool. If we have any questions. Maybe it's when shelf life is coming to those theatres. And um, so when you've spoken to ITV, is there any inkling that they might start putting prerequisites to product program makers to say that we need at least you to make this kind of, um, I don't know, whether 50 percent of the programmes I make or even all of them? Well, they already have a 20 percent um, set up for audio description. Um, but are they just taking those off because people are making them or are they you know, if because uh, Netflix has taken over now, I guess they can do what they want. But for example, if you went to Netflix and they said we actually require you to put this in, what kind of pushback have you had? Uh, Netflix has actually been doing a great job. Netflix is a company that started off with terrible accessibility service until they released the first season of Daredevil, and that's when people uh, launched a campaign online saying that you do know who Daredevil is, right? Thank God. I did give one a few talks where nobody knew who it was. So, uh, just in case you don't know, Daredevil is a blind superhero, and the campaign launched when the first season came out is that Daredevil wouldn't be able to watch his own show, and uh, this pushed uh, Netflix to um, add audio description to their programming. And since then, every production that they own so that they do is released with audio description and they have been from the online providers probably the best in doing this if anyone has a contact in netflix i wish i would appreciate it because we we have been chasing them for a while because i think that yeah companies that do their own content they have a lot of control on how that is um that how that is broadcast or, or shown online they are a sustaining member of our standards group Oh, okay. Oh, might be getting gold, an email. They're a gold member of our gold mm -hmm. sustaining, not mm -hmm. sustaining member, but standards sustaining. Oh, wow. You might be getting an email later. Um, thanks, Mariana. I, I just wanted to say it's very clear that you've almost created a whole new art format as something that has previously only really been considered as something very functional or mm. non-artistic, and I think that's really powerful. And especially when you think that impaired audiences haven't, been exposed to this in a creative context before mm. and I wonder if you anticipate audiences maybe you know l learning to, uh, to, to to receive these things in a creative way yeah. rather than a functional way and whether there may be some more traction to be gained as um, you know as that builds. Yeah I think it's kind of a bit tricky when you <sighs> something that it's kind of maybe been a bit trickier to convey is the fact that uh, this isn't audio description, uh, it is something different. It is apparently our test show just as accessible as standard audio description. But there is a lot of um, kind of, we're as when we listen to films, we're trained to listen to things in a certain way because we've been exposed to them for years. And the same happens with people that are visually impaired and have been watching audio description in a specific format for years. Then you bring something out new and there will be people that love it and there will be people that say, yeah, but you know, I miss that third person narration. Not because they're not getting the same information, but because suddenly you're exposing them to something different. Uh, that's why it's so important that it gets widespread and hopefully, of course, uh, in mainstream media as, as Netflix, because people need to be exposed to it. But as well, because we have that sharing aspect of it that it can, it has been proven to be effective for sighted people as well, is when people start gaining an interest in something because it's creative, then they start making it, and then that benefits the people that actually need it. Um, I have no idea if that answers your question, but uh, does it answer your question? No, I just think it's no. fascinating <laughs> that, yeah, no, totally, it's more a discussion point. I think it's fascinating that 
this is just the start of something and people yeah. will learn to interpret it in their own creative way Absolutely, and take it yeah. to new levels. Yeah, yeah. So. I mean, it was fun working with the students because we um, we were, come, Gavin, my colleague and I, were, were supposed to be giving them these guidelines, but we had never done a film from the start that used this. We had only done a film that was finished and then made it into an enhanced or description. So we actually, we learned from how the students were working with it on what was the best way. So for example, when the students started, we asked them, write the first person description when you write the original script. That was a mistake because then they, they, they shot the film, they decided to change loads of things and the script, uh, the description that they had created initially no longer worked and they had to redo it. So that's something that we only kind of, I, I know it sounds obvious, but until you don't have a group of people working on it, they tell you actually, as a script writer, I would have preferred to do it afterwards. You don't actually realise. So we did learn loads of things of what works and, and what doesn't. Thank you for that. Yes, I think I, I probably enjoyed the uh, enhanced audio description version more than the uh, traditional, normal, I mean, you. original version. Um, you obviously mentioned the idea of sharing the experience amongst people who are sighted as well as people yeah. who might have various levels of non-sighted disability or what have you. Um, and obviously here we're also listening to things in binaural. Have you considered how that's going to be uh, transmitted, delivered, uh, and whether there's going to be this optionality within a room, as in like maybe some Bluetooth version as opposed to not or what? Uh, uh, we haven't gotten too far in thinking about that. Uh, we, uh, we're now honestly thinking about what the next stage of the project is. Our funding runs out in May and we're, we're, we're looking for more money. If, if you have money to give me, I, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I like that. Uh, oh, well, <laughs> you can think about it. We, we, we have Netflix, that's okay. Um, but that would be the next big thing is to work uh, with companies, continue working with ITV and Dolby and seeing how we can actually in practical terms take it to the homes of people. Uh, this was never meant to be a laboratory ex experiment. It was also me always meant to go out uh, into the world. And that's why we worked so hard engaging with uh, visually impaired people and getting their opinions. Because ultimately, if no one benefits from it, then it just turns into something that, yeah, it's creative, it's fun, but it doesn't have a social impact at all. I'm a big believer in, in sort of multiple audio streams for things and, and being able to choose. Yeah you know, multiple outputs that would, would go to targeted audiences would be phenomenal. Even yeah. in cinemas, you know, you could, yeah. you could have the Dolby Atmos for everybody yeah. and then whatever, headphones for those who want it. And there's, uh, in Salford, there's some work um, that is similar but, uh, on hearing impairments and actually being able to modify the mix of a film so that you can actually, say, make speech clearer. Uh, so that's something that's been investigated as well. Uh, I, I don't know, I don't remember if we asked them, but we can ask them. Yeah, they, Are you uh, from Sky? <laughs> no, I'm not from Sky. No. Oh, my mum's um, registered blind. And she's okay. Visually, so um, they have already descriptive on yeah. Sky, so I was wondering. Yeah, I mean, yeah, these are the, um, the companies that we approached initially. Um, but, but yeah, we're, the more the merrier, I think, is the, the way to go. <laughs> Careful about putting my hand up until you stopped asking for money in case you thought oh, I was going to give you I'm always asking for money. <laughs> um, there is it's going to be a fun year. <laughs> there might be some prior art in the sense of the, um, the, the scripting in that the BBC have on occasions taken television series and ported them to radio. Yeah. Things like I think Doctor Who were done and others for occasions yeah. and in which sometimes a sort of a, a first party narrative was used. Yeah. So there may be some expertise within the radio community where dramas have been adapted for radio where, of course, there are no visuals. Yeah. Um, so that was... Yeah. And the one other point I just wanted to ask was on, the, on, on something like this with, the, with an international film, there are, of course, some challenges in that the, one of the reasons for only using centre dialogue tracks sometimes is much easier to put a French language version yeah. in. There's been occasions when films, you know, you've had a person speaking French and all the people in the cafe are actually talking English. Yeah. Because, you know, um, it, it's in the surrounds and they didn't want to remix those. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I can no, appreciate it's a technical point, yeah. challenge there. Yeah, but, um, I mean, yeah. obviously the project is very valuable. No, I think that's a very good point, yeah. So I just wanted to make a quick observation about the next which is quite an incredible driver. Um, I know for a fact that all the major post-production 
big, large video post-production facilities are pretty much in the next three, four months building audio description booths, the self-recording okay. booths. Cool. And, and literally, the, the one observation about the problems with the implementation for the enhanced is that because it's driven by Netflix and a delivery requirement, it becomes the uh, mastering who, who facilities um, problem. Sorry, who is driven by Netflix? So, so the requirement for audio description okay. being driven by the broadcast okay, right, delivery see. requirements means that the okay. producers push it to the mastering facility as a problem. Mm. So, i.e., we're delivering this asset to these different dis mm -hmm. companies and these ones require audio description. Right, you're the mastering house, here's the film. Now it's your job to put that as a stream in the INF or however it's being packaged. Um, the problem for enhanced audio description is that it's way too late by that stage to uh, even produce that. That's not what that. we're proposing. We're proposing that it's done in the production and post-production phase of the film. So before, so you do the, the recordings on location, you mix. So basically you're basically printing out another stem. That's yeah, what you're doing. Yeah, effectively, at the mix stage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, just a few thoughts, really. I guess, if, I mean, if you look to the audiobook industry, because I probably have a history of having this content that's been delivered that's a narration from the first-person perspective. So maybe that might be some interesting... Sorry, do you understand well, the, the first The audiobook part? industry? Audiobooks, yeah. So yeah. maybe there's some parallels there for yeah. practice that could be brought into some yeah. of your research. Yeah, I mean, we did look at radio drama, definitely, when the project's in its previous iteration, we did look at radio drama and a lot of techniques we use actually come from that field. Uh, we haven't necessarily looked at audiobooks, but that doesn't mean it's not something that, that we could do in the future. And I guess the other one is if the, the big goal for this is even to maybe have a distribution asset that is even multilingual. Because if you're going to go to Netflix, you need to maybe have that widening participation for their business model across yeah. all of their European, you know. So maybe that, that's, you know, another thought process about your stem yeah. mixing, isn't it, really? Cool. It seems more and more to me as if you're talking about a continuum of object audio so that people okay. could pick, uh, pick and choose what they wanted to mm. try. And in that way, in a way, it avoids this idea of an add-on because what you're doing is part of something which you may change yeah. for home viewing, yeah. you may change in a big theatre. Where are the gaps apart from an interchange format? Is it the way that individuals choose their menu for sound? You mean their menu in a physical menu to access something? Or? Yes, I mean, uh, in, a, in a way, they've, uh, you've got grandma who wants uh, <laughs> the description and in fact in our household we use a local speaker for that so okay. that everybody else is too uh, swamped but of course that makes life quite difficult because um, when you have this continuum you may watch the film on your phone and you will have yeah. to make <laughs> no, we so it is think, again we haven't thought about uh, distribution yet um, that does bring us back to that idea of having an experience that can be shared because what we actually want to avoid ultimately although this is ironic considering the project is in binaural audio but we want to try to avoid people wearing headphones because uh, many people feel very isolated when they suddenly have to sit down there and they hadn't suddenly have to put headphones on um, in cinemas it's quite complicated loads of volunteers and, and this is this is quite a horrible thing to tell someone but apparently people do it at the cinemas uh, they might be someone that is blind with headphones and then the person next to them says, do you really need those? Can you just turn the volume down? Which is awful, but that is a bit out of ignorance. The person that says that probably doesn't know what that's for. Maybe they think they're listening to music. I don't know what they're thinking. The person that needs the system then suddenly becomes really self-conscious that they're using this. And it's problematic from everyone. So the tests we've done with mixed audiences, we've had everybody wear headphones. So absolutely everybody has the same experience, regardless of whether they're watching the screen or not. And that means that people stop worrying about what the person next to them is doing or what they're experiencing. And it kind of creates it's a, a much kind of um, nicer experience of, of sharing. I think, I think that you need the mic. Um, 
So just to chip in, I thought that goes back to what I was talking about earlier or, or asking about earlier about the, the, the option of maybe having small earbuds that could receive the additional enhanced um, audio track only. But if it was at the right sort of level, you could mm. hear what's coming out of speakers. I'm thinking yeah. about cinema uh, presentation, for example. You could be in an auditorium with lots of people watching the, the normal cinema presentation and just, if you wanted it, could have the earbuds receiving an yeah. extra stream of audio descriptor that would kind of mix in with yeah. the speaker volume or something. I mean, it could be an option. Yeah, basically. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I think I, I might be the... Okay, one last... I'm, I'm aware that I'm standing between you and the drinks. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, now, do you have any idea how many cinemas are equipped with stereo headphone systems? Is with audio description systems? Oh, um, I can't remember the stats. I can get them for you. Not right now, uh, unless anybody else knows. Uh, there is a, I mean, there was a few years ago, there was a, quite a push on equip, equipping the cinemas. Now, what's happening, and this is something where the, uh, as many things, the stats and reality doesn't quite... <laughs> Equate. So uh, the stats tell us that most cinemas have audio description systems. Volunteers I talk to tell me that they go to the cinemas and nobody knows how to set the system on. Yes, and most hearing assisted, assisted systems are just loop amplifiers, which are only <laughs> mono, basically. Um, but that's not, only, that's not the only problem. It's just that you don't even get the basic stuff. So they don't know how to switch on the audio description system. So if you're blind and you go to the cinema that was advertised as having a screening with audio description, uh, it's very common. And I've heard this thousands of times from volunteers that go there and the people working at the cinema say, I don't actually know what that is. We have the, the one person that knows how to switch that on is on holidays uh, or the system is broken. And I've had um, a situation of a lady that kept going to the cinema and they kept giving her free vouchers because the system didn't work. She went with the free vouchers and the system still didn't work. She has a collection of free vouchers she cannot use. Uh, that's just frustrating and that it means that many people start drawing away from cultural experiences because they're tired of having to go there and being told they're kind of not wanted because imagine the staff of the cinema if they don't know how to operate the equipment you can i can only imagine their faces of god i can't believe i'm being asked to switch this on uh so i think that we have more basic problems than stereo it's not only uh, sight impaired i went to a cinema not long ago where they forgot to turn the lights on oh <laughs> <laughs> that is quite bad the house lights were on the film was running oh god did, did you get your money back <laughs> Thank God for that popcorn person. Good. So I think uh, if it's okay, we'll wrap up. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.